Oh, what's oh, what that? that? Jack. An Almaco Jack? Oh, weird. Oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. There's a mahi. All right. They are trying to eat my squid. They right up on the surf. Finally, one got the hook. Oh, yeah, dude. While most of the headboat trips departing northeast ports return after four to eight hours of fishing, the trip Anthony DeCicci and I are boarding on this drizzly mid-October morning won't be returning for a day and a half. We're headed for the canyons, fishing aboard the Helen H. out of Hyannis, Massachusetts, with a crew of fishermen from all over New England looking to get a fall tuna fix. As fishermen load the boat with tackle, clothes, and provisions, the mates cut enough chunks of butterfish, sardines, and herring to last for more than 20 hours of chum. After loading our gear and selecting our spot at the rail, Cheech and I settle in for the long ride to Hudson Canyon. So the Helen H started in the 50s. My father started the boat with a 45-foot wood boat, went to a 65-foot wood boat, which is in Cab Tree, New York now, and then the Helen H after that, the 100-foot Helen H. Uh, 30 years ago, we decided to leave the Sheepshead Bay location and move up to Cape Cod, primarily because fishing was, was so much better and there's more opportunity in the party boat business. So we didn't really start that much fluke fishing early on. It was more bluefish and porgies in the spring and uh, some sea bass. Uh, codfish was big right out of the gate uh, offshore. That was our big offshore fishery. Uh, and then as time went by, we, we, we started moving into other, you know, other fisheries, including fluke. Fluke was real good in Nantucket Sound, close to home. We would, we would have phenomenal fluke fishing on our four-hour half-day trips where tourists could catch a 10-pound fluke. And uh, over time, there was enough pressure there between commercial and, and recreational fishermen that that area uh, kind of dried up, and that's kind of common with, uh, with fluke. And we moved further and further off, and for a number of years, we fished offshore in the shoals. You took over the business from, from your dad? Yes, that's correct. When, when was that? That was, uh, well, my father passed away when I was in college, and uh, then after that, I took over over the business. That was in Sheepshead Bay, and then, then all through uh, the time up here. So uh, we, uh, uh, myself and my wife, moved up here in 93, and we just put, the, put our stuff on the boat and the crew, and we all headed up, uh, up to the Cape. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a bit of a challenge at first, but it, it worked out well. Now, the, uh, the Helen H itself, it's a 100-foot aluminum? 100-foot aluminum boat, uh, powered by three MTU 60 series, 2,500 horsepower. So, uh, because we, we, we do a lot of trips that are longer distance, uh, speed's important for the boats that we have, so we can get trips in where you normally wouldn't be able to do it uh, if you had, you know, a slower boat. Now this trip we ran, how far did we run again? 150 miles. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good run. And you, uh, is, that, is that about the, the furthest that, that you That's about trip? the limit on how far we would go on a canyon trip. Uh, generally it's more in the 90 to 110 mile range. Uh, but when, when you're canyon fishing, it's all about uh, water temp and, and bait. And right now, the, it's late in the season. Everything south of Nantucket, north, southeast of Nantucket, uh, is all cooled down uh, as it gets later. And we have to go further to, further to the southwest. And uh, we'll go wherever we have to go to make the trip right. Now, is that, you'll start your season like to some of the far canyons that the sport boats really don't get to quite as often. Like yeah, as far, far east is Oceanographers Canyon, and then work our way uh, a lot of times we'll start there and just march our way over the weeks further and further to the uh, to the west. 
So that's generally like the fish will move? Yeah, move the fish in the water the move to the west. Generally what you have is uh, you have the Gulf Stream coming up the coast, going north and then east, but the eddies tend to curl off to the north onto the bank and then they push back to the west. So they tend to, uh, you tend to have this uh, circular uh, movement of water where everything, where we're fishing is over time working west as yeah. the season goes on. Now, when does your when do you start running the uh, the canyon trips, the offshore trips? We start around Labor Day, and then we go through till about the third week of October. Okay. And if uh, if somebody was looking to get on a canyon, their first ever uh, tuna trip, I always recommend the the head boat trip. It is the most it's it's the most economical way to get to the uh, to the canyons for sure, and you're going to get an education there. Yeah, so. we we have uh, we have top top uh, top of the line rental equipment which makes it easier for someone, you know, that's new at tuna fishing uh, to be able to handle the fish. Plus we have a great crew that takes care of the, the people, make sure they get uh, everything we can do to make sure every fish comes in the boat. And uh, if you're gonna give one tip to, to somebody coming on on their first can trip, what would it be? Would it... Um, I would say pay attention to what everybody else, the, the more avid fishermen are doing. Uh, you know, pay attention to what I say or the captain that's running the boat says about depth on where to be. Uh, you want to be in the right place, the right depth, the right tackle. Um, start off the way the way we do it, and if you want to switch up from, from there later on, uh, that's fine too. But you know, we've been doing it a long time. We, we, try and, we try and get everybody situated so everybody's got a good shot. Now, do you, would you recommend, uh, if you were gonna go, come on one of these trips and you had to get some sleep in, if you didn't want, we're gonna drink all the coffee in the boat and then uh, stay at the rail all night, when would you take that nap? When would be the ideal time? So, what, what I try and tell, tell people is, uh, anytime that the boat's running, that's a good time to catch up on, on some sleep, on the ride out. As much as it's hard to sleep during the day, it's try your best, get some hours in. Uh, so when, when we're, like, for instance, last night we were fishing through the night and half the people run out of steam and sometimes they miss out on some of the best fishing. Sometimes they bite early in the evening. Sometimes, you know, the last fish was at 6.30 in the morning. So it's, uh, you know, you want to have, you, you want to be uh, at the rail when the best opportunities uh, are there. Taking Captain Joe's advice, I retire to the below deck bunks to get a little more sleep until it's time to fish. So every headboat has kind of a different approach to these offshore trips. The Helen H likes to begin them by trolling. So we just got to the fishing grounds. Captain Joe Huckmeyer said he's got some good, clean water temperature he likes. And uh, we just set out the trolling spread here. And uh, Cheech and I are in group three. The way they, they operate it is they break all the different uh, passengers into groups. So there's group one, eight guys on that, group two, eight guys, and then group three, eight guys. And uh, you get assigned one rod while you're in your group going at uh, certain intervals. I think it's 15 or 20 minute intervals. And uh, if your rod goes down, you get the, you get that fish. But uh, when somebody's finding a fish, the Hell and H Joe will go off, uh, you know, pull back the throttles and you'll have a chance to drop a jig to catch any stragglers that might be up as long as you do it on the front half of the boat. So that's why Cheech and I are jig, uh, getting our jigging gear ready to uh, when there's a hookup, since we're not gonna be up there till group three, we're gonna run to the front of the boat, drop our jigs, see if we can uh, pick up some loose change. We troll for a couple hours, rotating through every group, but don't raise a fish. After seeing some promising marks on the fish finder, Captain Joe decides to pull in the lines and begin chunking. It's as simple as it gets, man. Egg sinker, bead to protect the knot. So this has got Seaguar 80 pound thread lock, which is a hollow core. I did an end loop in it and then did a wind on leader, which has 60 pound test. No, no, excuse me, 80 pound test, Seaguar uh, blue label. And this is gonna be the jigging, one of our jigging setups for the night. I just gotta decide what jig to put on there. So Matt, the, uh, the head mate here on the Helen H said that the fish are primarily on squid. So that uh, pink might be a good color if you're, for your jigs. I guess I could have shared that with Cheech. Yeah, you waited, you definitely waited. <laughs> So 
So chunking's a lot about stealth, man. So you'd think, you know, 40 to 80 pound yellowfin tuna, you think you'd want a big hook, but in reality, you want a hook that's small enough to be able to hide in, in the chunk. So this is a uh, Gamakatsu Nautilus Circle. And I might even go down one size. I think this is a 5.0. I might go to a 4.0. Oh, fish it hole. Uh, yeah, you can cut well it in half if you want, to, you know, cut the tail yeah. off. Okay. Because you can the head. Squid or uh, right roll now, one squid and one half. Oh, look at this, dude. Teach, teach. Look, Tommy. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So we just got we just got off the troll. We're out in Hudson Canyon, and we just started chumming. Hope to get some tunas by the boat, and uh, I got a squid. Jimmy's got a herring, and we're gonna see uh, what they're in the mood for. See if we can get uh, one hooked up here. Yeah, Captain Joe said he's, uh, we tried trolling, nothing came up. So he's been marking fish, but everything's been deep. It's been 250, uh, 300 feet down. So we're uh, setting up the chum slick, hoping to get some stuff a little bit shallower, and setting our baits down to where the tunas are. So I always thought one of the things with tuna chunking is you wanted to, to kind of let your bait go at the same rate as the chum. So rather than just bomb it down there uh, to the depth, kind of let it out a little bit more slowly, gives it more of a natural fall. It looks more like the chum that's, uh, that's bringing them to the boat as it flutters down. In the wide expanse of the continental shelf, floating structure like a high flyer and buoy marking a set of commercial lobster pots, acts like a magnet for small bait fish seeking shelter from the legions of pelagic predators. Seeking an easy meal and some shelter themselves, Mahi Mahi also congregate around those buoys, at least until a good chum slick pulls them away and onto a bigger piece of floating structure, like say, a 100 foot aluminum headboat. They are trying to eat my squid, they right up on the surface, finally one got the hook. Oh, yeah, dude. All right. Oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. There's a mahi. All right. There's some unbelievable colors on them. You can almost see them change before your eyes. You know, they've got blues, yellows, greens. Oh, there we go. All right. All pretty much the same size, but they're definitely, we've got the structure right there. This one's a little bit, might be a little bit better. A little bigger than my last one. Yeah, so we got a whole ton of mahi. There's the high flyer right there. And uh, we've got the mahi below us. They've moved off the high flyer into our chum slick. And, uh, you know, we're breaking the ice. Some fish, getting some, some meat in the box. Oh, come on, go over. Oh, what's what that? that? Jack. An Almaco Jack. Oh, weird. Cool, man. That's very cool. It's a new species. It's an Almaco Jack, dude. So mixed in with the mahi, we just passed some pots. And uh, yeah, it's a new species for me. No tuning yet, but we're putting some fish in the boat, so that's a good sign.
What's going on everybody? I'm Anthony DeCicci with On The Water and I want to talk to you about dressing appropriately. We're on the Helen H in the Northeast Canyons in the fall targeting uh, yellowfin tuna. You never know what you're going to get dealt for a hand with the weather so you have to cover all your bases and the easiest way to do that is to think about staying dry at all times and staying warm at all times. Now, we know it's easier to shed layers than add layers. Sometimes these flurries when you're tuna fishing out in the canyons, they happen very quick. You don't want to have to walk away from the rail. Um, you want to maximize your time fishing. So to do that, guys, dress appropriately. Taking it from, from the bottom up, deck boss, rubber boots from Grundens. They're going to keep your feet dry. I got wool socks on underneath these because these rubber boots can get cold if it gets really cold so you want to have an additional layer under there in, in the wool socks as you can see underneath my bibs i got a pair of grundens sweatpants they're stretchy super comfortable um, your, your bibs slide over them really easy they don't get caught on them an extra layer of warmth uh, from from the waist down is nice and then you have your outer shell which is the gore-tex bibs from Grundens, that's going to be impenetrable by water, going to keep you dry. And then moving up, I always like to start with a performance shirt at the base. Just because if you're fighting a tuna, you're going to get sweaty, that wicks the, the moisture off of your body and it keeps you dry and it dries out quickly. On top of that, I have a Grundens flannel, which is another layer of warmth and comfort. And then at nightfall, and when it gets cold, I was wearing this, this fleece hoodie from Grundens right here over my flannel. Super warm. You don't get a chance to go back and run to the dock or the truck to go pick stuff up. So you want to take the time to think about what you're going to wear when you're going to spend two days in the canyons. And then the outer shell, that's what keeps you super dry at all times. Again, Gore-Tex, impenetrable by water gonna keep the wind off he's gonna keep you super comfortable it's gonna seal that outer shell that's basically the best way to approach dressing appropriately for two days in the Northeast canyons in the fall what do I want to do right now do I want to drop a tuna bait down since everybody's around lying thinking I was wondering that myself huh I was wondering that myself but like there's some tuna creeping around down there the mahi action slows and everyone on board sets their sights on the bigger marks Captain Joe has spotted 250 feet down the slowdown is only temporary though as we drift toward another high flyer another school of mahi finds our chump slick this one made up of bigger fish and the mahi mayhem resumes Oh, is that quick? That's a better one there. Absolute craziness now with the mahi right around just just to pass another high flyer and uh, ooh, a little bit. Better class of them than we had on the last one. My biggest one of the trip so far, man. <laughs> As we take in a beautiful sunset 150 miles from home, I'm content to have some fish in the cooler. Regardless of what happens overnight, at least we beat the skunk. But the trip is far from over. Cheech and I slug some cold coffee, check our rigging, and get ready for the main event.